Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of our sponsors, including Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation at AaronV.com, A-A-R-O-N-V dot com. Making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida. You're listening to episode 200 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about the story of John Sabold and his wedding to a beautiful ghost bride. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. In the early 20th century, John Sabold was a salt-of-the-earth Kansas farmer. But by 1927, John was alone in the world, and he sought consolation by contacting the world of the spirits. Eventually, he met a ghost named Sarah, and the two of them really hit it off. They concluded that they were soulmates and decided to get married. So who was John Sabold, and who was Sarah? And were they able to find happiness together? That's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. So, Jimmy, tell me, who is the central figure in our story today? His name was John Sabold, and he was born around 1855. So he was about 10 years old when the American Civil War started. And he was 71 or 73 when our story is set. You'll see him said to be both 71 and 73 in different accounts. In 1927, he was living in the town of Liberal, Kansas, and for our overseas listeners, Kansas is a state that's smack dab in the middle of the United States. I also grew up near there in Arkansas, which almost shares a corner with Kansas. Um, Liberal was founded in 1888 when John would have been about 33 years old. The name of the town reportedly comes from its founder, S.S. Rogers, who built the first house there in 1872. Rogers became famous for giving drinks of water to thirsty travelers, and this led to people responding with the saying, that's very liberal of you. At the time, the word liberal wasn't used in the exclusively political way it is now. It just meant generous. Today, there are about 20,000 people living in liberal, and there were about 4,000 people there in 1927 when our story is set. Liberal is in the southern part of Kansas near the Oklahoma border, and John was a rather well-off farmer who owned two farms, one on the Kansas side of the border and one on the Oklahoma side. And what was his family life like? By 1927, he had been married twice, and I've seen different accounts of how the marriages ended. According to one account I've read, he was a widower who outlived both his wives, but I've seen another account that says they ended in divorce, so I'm not sure what the case is. John also had a son whom he really loved. Unfortunately, the son died in early manhood, and in 1927, John was alone in the world. Did he have any interests that he used to fill his time? In the late 1890s, when he would have been in his early 40s, John became interested in spiritualism. Spiritualism was a new religious movement that had started in New York State in the 1840s. It was begun by a pair of girls known as the Fox Sisters, and they claimed to be able to speak with the dead. We mentioned the Fox Sisters in episode 137 on mediums, and we'll have an episode devoted specifically to them in the future. Spiritualism became extremely popular, especially during and after the Civil War, because so many families had lost loved ones during the fighting, and they wanted to make sure that their loved ones were okay in the afterlife, so people would go to mediums to contact their departed. Spiritualism got another boost after World War I and all of the soldiers who died during it. It eventually faded out in the mid-20th century, though there are still spiritualist churches around today, and there are certainly many mediums. And how did Mr. Sabold's interest in spiritualism progress? 
in October of 1925, he came from his home, which was in Liberal, to Wichita, Kansas. Wichita is the largest city in Kansas. It's not actually the state capital, that's Topeka, but it is the biggest city. Today, there are about 400,000 people living there, and in 1925, there were about 10,000, um, sorry, 100,000 people living there. While in Wichita, John met a woman named Nellie C. Moore. She had been born around 1889, so she was 36 years old at the time, and she was a divorcee, having separated from her husband, Ernest D. Bowman. She also had two children, Mary, age 13, and Audine, age 10. Mrs. Moore was a spiritualist medium, and she agreed to help John get in touch with his deceased son. She charged $2 per seance. Money is worth 16 times less now than it was in 1927 because of the inflation the government has caused, as we discussed last episode, episode 199. So each seance cost John $32 in today's money. And was Mrs. Moore able to help John reach his son in the spirit world? Yes, and his son was happy to have contact with his dad. In fact, his son promised to give to provide guidance to his father from the spirit world for the rest of John's life, you know, to help with problems, make decisions, things like that. The advice would come through Mrs. Moore. John also received advice from Dr. Greer, who was Mrs. Moore's spirit guide. Spiritualist mediums frequently have guides in the spirit world that they use on a regular basis, such as for contacting the individual spirits that people want to reach. A spirit guide is kind of the equivalent of a medium, except in the spirit world. You have a living client, known as the sitter, who goes to a living medium here in our world. The medium then gets in touch with her spirit guide, and the spirit guide tries to contact the person that the sitter wants to speak with. So the medium and the guide work kind of as a team trying to put people in this world in connection with the right people in the other world. And what were the seances that John attended like? They seem to have been fairly typical for the period. A bunch of common mediumistic practices had developed in the 19th century as part of the spiritualist movement. One of them was holding seances in darkened rooms. That was something that mediums in previous centuries hadn't really been into, and mediums today often work in full light. But if you've ever wondered why you see seances in movies and TV shows depicted as being in a dark room, or why ghost hunting shows on TV regularly depict people running around in houses in the dark, whereas real parapsychological investigators want to see what they're investigating. Um, It goes back to 19th century mediums. They said the darkness made it easier to contact the spirits, and to prove it, they often had physical demonstrations, like ghostly glowing forms of spirits appearing in the rooms, or spirit hands materializing and touching people, handling objects, or playing musical instruments. Mediums who were able to produce physical effects like this were known as physical mediums, as opposed to mental mediums who were simply in mental contact with the spirits and spoke on their behalf. Many physical mediums in this period also used large cabinets. They would go inside the cabinet, and sometimes they would be tied up inside the cabinet so they couldn't move. And then Ghosts would move objects about, including playing musical instruments, or shadowy, sometimes ghostly forms would emerge while the mediums were tied up in the cabinet. What did critics make of them using darkness and cabinets? They charged that these were simply practices the mediums introduced so that they could use the darkness or the concealment provided by the cabinet to hide what they were really doing, which was said to be using stage magic techniques to hoax the presence of ghosts and cheat their clients out of money. And in fact, competent researchers, such as the members of the British Society for Psychical Research and the American Society for Psychical Research, had caught many physical mediums doing exactly that. They began catching them in the late 19th century, and they continued to do so in the early 20th century. In light of that, did John suspect that Mrs. Moore might be playing a trick on him, like an April Fool's joke or something? April 1st or April Fool's Day 
did fall on a Friday in 1927, but I don't have a record of John having attended a seance with her then. Uh, we're getting a bit of ahead, ahead of ourselves, though, because we're still dealing with when he first met Mrs. Moore in 1925. And as a student of spiritualism for 30 years, John was a believer, and he was thoroughly convinced by the seances he attended. Mrs. Moore did use many of the conventions of the day, though, right from their very first seance together. According to the San Francisco Examiner, The farmer attended a seance at the home of Mrs. Moore in Wichita. The seance was in a room draped with black and furnished only with a few chairs and a table. In one corner was a cabinet. In the very first seance, Mrs. Moore, in a semi-trance, told the Kansan that his son had come to her and was telling her what to say to the visitor. The son, she said, wanted the father to be guided by him for the remainder of his life and promised to advise him through Mrs. Moore. In the same sitting, a spirit guide by the name of Dr. Greer also appeared, Mrs. Moore said. The doctor said he was a managing spirit in the spirit world and that Mr. Sabold must follow the guidance of his son's spirit. The farmer began going to Mrs. Moore's home for private seances and conferences with the son in the spirit world. Also, John reported that the spirits made a good bit of noise during these seances, and he got to meet quite a number of them. There were a number of them with whom he became acquainted, including his son, a Dr. Greer, other physicians, lawyers, and the like. Some of the ghosts were American Indians, he said. How do you know they were Indians, he was asked. Because they called me chief, was the reply. Incidentally, John picked up another nickname from the spirit world. Mrs. Moore's spirit guide, Dr. Greer, began calling John Doctor. And so everybody at the house, including Mrs. Moore's other followers, referred to John as Doctor. Of course, he was actually a farmer, not a doctor, but he apparently gave folk medical advice sometimes, and he once helped one of Mrs. Moore's followers get rid of a headache. Mrs. Moore also warned him that he could be in danger if things went wrong during a seance. Mrs. Moore cautioned him not to attempt to touch the ghosts, as that would mean death to her and him. Turning on any lights would also be fatal, he says he was told. Immediate death was to be the penalty for interfering with the walking and talking of any spirits. So don't try to touch the ghosts, turn on the lights, or interfere with any of the spirits he saw in the darkened room. Doing so would mean immediate death if a living person came in contact with a dead one. Also, through some kind of spiritual feedback, it would also mean that Mrs. Moore would die since the spirit was manifesting through her. So there were two lives on the line. But uh, his son came through on his promise and provided guidance for John. After a few of the seances, the son, speaking through Mrs. Moore, said, Father, you must go back home, raise the money you can, and move to Wichita. While the farmer was following this instruction, Mrs. Moore was to rent a larger and more comfortable home and furnish it so that Mr. Sabold, returning, could more fully develop as a spiritualist. In the larger house, it was pointed out there would be more opportunity for him to, quote, take the work. So John Sabold boarded a train and went back to his hometown of Liberal, Kansas. His banker asked him what he wanted to do with the money, but he was noncommittal and finally raised $3,000. $3,000 in 1925 would be equivalent to $48,000 today. The idea was that John would move in with Mrs. Moore and her daughters so that he could do more frequent seances and fully develop as a spiritualist. The trouble was the current house Mrs. Moore was living in was too small for all four of them, and being a divorcee, she didn't have a lot of money. So John would rent a new house for them, for them that would be larger. And as a lodger in the house, he would pay for his room and board at a rate of $40 per month, which is equivalent to about $650 today. Did they have enough furniture for the new larger house they were renting? No. So Mrs. Moore took John on a shopping trip and he spent $1,700 or $27,000 in today's money to buy the furniture that they need for the house. That $1,700 represented more than half of the $3,000 he had brought with him from his bank in Liberal. Was John concerned about spending this much money? Oh, no. You see, he was going to get it all back. Uh, his son and Dr. Greer assured him that Mrs. Moore would pay him back. According to the San Francisco Examiner, 
In a few days, according to Mr. Sabold, Mrs. Moore executed a promissory note for $1,244.35 and gave him a chattel mortgage covering her motor car in house furnishings. Chattel is a term that just means property. Specifically or technically, it means property other than real estate. So by giving John a chattel mortgage, Mrs. Moore was promising to either pay him back or let him take her automobile and the furnishings from the house. She was putting them up as collateral, in other words. And then John was introduced to the love of his life. And who was she? Her name was Sarah, and we don't have a lot of information about her previous earthly life. In fact, we don't even seem to have a last name or the dates when she lived. But she and John fell for each other hard, and they concluded that they were soulmates. What did John like about her? Well, for one thing, she was interested in him, and men like it when a woman takes an interest in them, especially if they were older men who were alone and don't have anybody else, like in the biblical book of Ruth, where Ruth takes an interest in a kind older man named Boaz. While he was sleeping with his workers after a hard day threshing grain, Ruth came up to him in the night and uncovered his feet, which is a Hebrew euphemism for making romantic advances on him. And then we read, At midnight the man was startled and turned over, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. He said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Spread your garment over your maidservant, for you are next of kin. And he said, May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first, in that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. So Boaz was really pleased that Ruth took an interest in him rather than the younger men, and the two of them got married, and they eventually became the great-grandparents of King David. So this is a very human thing. Given that we don't have arranged marriages anymore here in the U.S., I mean, it's harder to find somebody, and I know I as a widower would be intrigued if some young, attractive, healthy woman was taking an interest in me. And certainly John, at age 73, must have felt a bit like Boaz when this new ghostly girlfriend, Sarah, took an interest in him and offered him companionship. Did he get to see Sarah? Yes, she was able to materialize enough for him to see her transparent, glowing, ghostly form in the dark room of the seance. And he apparently liked what he saw, uh, perhaps indicating that she was attractive. John also is on record as having said that he liked the sound of her voice because Mrs. Moore was a physical medium and she was able to cause Sarah's voice to manifest. Another thing that John liked about Sarah is that she was a generous soul. Literally, as illustrated by the fact she took an interest in wayward girls and wanted to help them. On one of the occasions of her appearances, Sarah asked for $500 to be used in the salvation of wayward girls, Sabold said. When Sarah said she wanted $500 for wayward girls, I asked how she, a spirit, could get it to them. She replied that she would materialize as she did for me. I wrote the check for $500, and at the next seance, when I saw illuminated hands reach out, I put it into those hands. And $500 was quite a generous donation to the Wayward Girls, being equivalent to $8,000 today. And John was willing to pay it, so both he and Sarah were very generous souls, and you can see how they came to regard each other as soulmates. And this was not lost on Mrs. Moore, who could see how the couple cared for each other. So she acted as matchmaker and arranged for them to marry each other. And who would perform the ceremony? Oh, Mrs. Moore herself would do that. I don't know if she was an ordained minister in the spiritualist church, but as a spiritualist medium, she was able to marry the two in the course of a seance. First, though, there were a lot of preparations that needed to be made, because there are always lots of preparations you need to make for a wedding unless you deliberately decide to keep it simple. But the bride-to-be did not want a simple bare-bones wedding. She wanted to do it up. Uh, one of the things you need for a traditional wedding is a wedding ring. Did they get one of those? They did. Uh, Sarah expressed an interest in a diamond ring that Mrs. Moore had. John saw it and asked how valuable it was. Mrs. Moore said that when she had needed to get through hard times, as a penniless divorcee, she had often been able to put the ring in hock for $175, or about $2,800 today. 
John wasn't sure, though. He wanted to get it appraised, and Mrs. Moore was happy to oblige. Then appeared the ghost of a jeweler who spoke with a German accent and assured the future bridegroom that the ring easily was worth $225 to $250, or between $3,600 and $4,000 today. So now that the ghost of the German jeweler had given his professional opinion that the ring was worth that much, John proceeded to pay Mrs. Moore the $175 she commonly got when she needed to pawn the ring. And thus, John had a valuable wedding ring for his bride-to-be. How was he going to put it on her finger? Oh, she was going to materialize, like when she picked up the $500 check for the wayward girls. And even better, Sarah promised that she would come to Earth when she married him, so she was going to fully materialize. What other arrangements did they need to make for the wedding? One was finding a place for John and Sarah to live. And it so happened that the house they were renting for Mrs. Moore had a sleeping porch. We don't tend to have sleeping porches today because we have air conditioning, but in the 1920s, people would have a screened-off porch or balcony that they would sleep on during the hot summer months because the night breeze would blow through the big screens around the porch or the balcony a lot better than through just a small bedroom window. So John and Sarah would stay on the sleeping porch, which meant that they needed to furnish that. Sarah told me I should buy additional furniture, fancy curtains, linens, silverware, and rugs for the approaching wedding, John said. A few days thereafter, the medium bought and I paid for the following items. Sleeping porch furniture, two small rugs, a gas-heating stove, and electric heater, bedroom linens, dishes, hardware, two electric lamps, three scarves, and table linens to the total sum of $521.55, or... $8,300 today. So now John and Sarah had the furnishings they'd need for their new life together. John also purchased the material for Sarah's wedding dress, which Mrs. Moore gave to a dressmaker. John and another of Mrs. Moore's followers, a tailor, also went out to pick up a good suit for John to wear to the wedding. How was Mrs. Moore faring at this time? She owed John a lot of money for the furnishings he'd bought for her house, for her and her daughters to use. And she couldn't have been bringing in a lot of money at just $2 per seance. Mrs. Moore wasn't doing very well financially. Uh, John was very generous with his money, but he wasn't giving it to her. He loaned her the money, and she was expected to pay it back. He gave $500 for the wayward girls, but that didn't go to Mrs. Moore since the ghostly Sarah took it. And he bought more than $500 in new furnishings, but those were for him and Sarah to use. So Mrs. Moore was having trouble making ends meet. In addition, she had to take time away from doing seances and earning money to do housework. So during a seance, John's son said that the housework was too heavy for Mrs. Moore and she should have a maid. John then generously began paying for one at the rate of $5 a week or $80 a week today. Meanwhile, according to the San Francisco Examiner, Plans for the ghost wedding went on apace. Mr. Sabold was urged to prepare himself mentally and spiritually. One of the ways he could do this was by deeding over his two farms to Mrs. Moore. The farm in Oklahoma was 320 acres in size, and the one in Kansas was just as big. He would retain the use of the farms for as long as he lived, but after he passed on, they would go to Mrs. Moore and help support the work of spiritualism. And they could do a lot of good because they were quite profitable. According to an article in the Wichita Eagle, The value of Sabold's farmlands is indicated by his statement that after he had spent the $3,000 he first raised on which to move to Wichita, he went to Liberal in June 1926 and collected from harvested crops and rental on his farms the sum of $6,500, or $104,000 today. So you can see why Mrs. Moore thought the farms could do a lot to help the spiritualist cause after John's death, and deeding them over would make an excellent form of spiritual preparation for his coming wedding. What did John think of that? At first, he wasn't sure. I mean... He would continue to have the property during his life, so it's not like he'd be out anything. But he wanted a second opinion, and once again, Mrs. Moore was happy to oblige. According to the San Francisco Examiner, 
When he demurred and said he wished to consult an attorney about it, the medium in a seance called in the spirit of Sam B. Amadon, a leading Kansas City attorney who recently had died. Mr. Amadon for years was Democratic National Committeeman from Kansas and for some time was vice chairman of the Democratic National Committee. And he was a really good choice to give legal advice on this case because he came highly recommended as the best attorney in the spirit world. John also knew about him from his prior career on Earth. His skill as a lawyer and his wisdom was a matter of knowledge to the aged farmer, and he listened and heeded, he says, when the spirit, through Mrs. Moore, told him to deed the property. So the farms in Kansas and Oklahoma were transferred to her. John indicated that he did this. Out of gratitude for his successful courtship, and in the hope of being developed as a spiritualist to the point where he might, alone and husbandly, as it were, hold communication with his wife and other friends of that paradise of the no longer quick. So that he could, you know, get some alone time with his new bride without Mrs. Moore needing to be there. Because if you're newly married, you definitely don't want a chaperone along. But if John were sufficiently developed as a spiritualist, he could contact Sarah on his own and she could materialize for their alone time. And with that, let's take a quick break because we want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Craig A., Mary S., Ka N., Bewley O. and Robert O. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by Catechism Class, a dynamic weekly podcast journey through the Catechism of the Catholic Church by Greg and Jennifer Willits. It's the best book club, coffee talk, and faith study group all rolled into one. Find it in any podcast directory. So, Jimmy, what happened next in the story of John Sabold and his ghost bride? Eventually, the joyful day arrived and the wedding took place. And did Sarah materialize for the wedding as she promised? Unfortunately, she didn't materialize fully the way John had hoped, but she did materialize enough for him to put the ring on her finger. The San Francisco Examiner describes what happened. Spiritualists in large numbers assembled in the darkened seance room. Flowers for which the bridegroom had paid adorned the furnishings. The ring ceremony was used, the circlet for which Mr. Sabold had paid Mrs. Moore $175 being placed by him on an extended finger, which was supposed to be Sarah's. Mindful of previous warnings, the bridegroom did not attempt to reach out and grasp the spirit. He noted that her finger seemed lifelike, but did not touch any other part of the spirit body. Spooky in its setting and solemn in its enactment, the wedding went on. John Sabold, 73-year-old farmer, alive, took Sarah, age uncertain and dead, to be his wife. After the wedding ceremony itself came the celebratory wedding banquet. John had put up $100, or $1,600 today, to pay for the expenses, though one account I've read suggests that only half of that ended up being used. At the head of the table, with an empty chair at his side, sat the bridegroom. The empty chair and untouched plate were the bride's, he was told. Some of the guests dared chat and laugh, but not the bridegroom. Always there was in his mind the belief that his bride sat next to him. She was in the spirit world and he was in this, but he had felt her finger and had slipped the ring over it to bind her to him as his wife, and it was no time for joking for John Sabold. The wedding feast food did not taste as palatable as that which he had eaten at other times, but somehow the time dragged by and the dinner guests adjourned to other parts of the house. John Sabold was not left alone with the bride, always the medium was there to speak for the bride. It was only a short time until the bride drifted away in spirit, and John Sabold was alone. Sometime later, Mrs. Moore told him that his guides wanted to talk to him in a private seance, and when he spoke with them, they asked him to raise some additional money. Thus, in July of 1926, he went back to Liberal, 
only the second time he'd been back since uh, moving to Wichita. That first time was when he collected the $6,500 for the crops and the rent on his farm. When he got back, he paid for Mrs. Moore to purchase a new automobile. And buying automobiles was still something of a novelty in 1926. They would actually write it up in the local newspaper when someone in town bought a car. I found this notice in the August 29th, 1926 edition of the Wichita Eagle. It's in a column called A Long Auto Row, and it says, Mrs. Nellie Seymour, 710 North Lawrence Avenue, is driving a new Hudson coach purchased the past week from the Mossbacher Motor Company. So how exciting having a new car back in the day when this was newsworthy enough to get you written up in the local paper? The new car costs $1,200 or about $19,000 today. Mrs. Moore's daughters were also the benefits of John's liberality. While the U.S. created taxpayer-supported schools in the 19th century, in part to try to keep children out of privately funded Catholic schools, the public schools didn't have as high a reputation for quality education even back in the 1920s. As a result, John generously paid for Mrs. Moore's daughters, Amy and Audine, to go to a private school known as the Mount Carmel Academy. The tuition amounted to $1,500 or about $24,000 today. And what about John? Was he spending any money on himself? Indeed, though John was a very selfless guy and didn't naturally think about himself, fortunately, Sarah was concerned about her new husband and wanted him to be happy, so she suggested he spend something on himself. According to the examiner, There was no piano in the spiritual medium's home. In a seance, Sarah, the bride, was quoted as saying there should be one. How could a bridegroom be happy without music? Let him put dull care aside. So $500 or $8,000 today was spent for a piano. If he would practice 10 minutes a day on the piano, the spirits would so guide his fingers that he could and would become proficient in playing the piano. But his fingers at 73 were not as supple as when he was young. Years of toil on the farm had hardened his hands, and he found playing the piano a dull diversion. A phonograph was then suggested and bought and it was more or less gay life the bridegroom lived, coming in contact almost daily with his bride in Ghostland and hearing words of guidance from her through the medium. Phonographs, or record players, were not as inexpensive as they would come to be later in the 20th century due to mass production and the electronics revolution. So John ended up paying about $195 or around $3,000 today for the record player. Did anything happen to spoil their honeymoon? Unfortunately, yes. Uh, Mrs. Moore was still not doing well financially, and she confided to John that she was broke. She simply was not bringing in enough money to pay him back for the furniture and the new car that he had bought her. So she suggested that if he would release her from the promissory note and the chattel mortgage that he held on those, she would give him back the warranty deeds for his two farms. He could then take the deeds to the bank and borrow all the money he could to help her out of her current financial situation. What did John think of that? Well, it was at this point that he became suspicious. It looked to him like she was trying to get out from under the debts she owed him without really costing herself anything since he'd also given her the deeds to the land in the first place. And then she wanted to have him use those deeds to raise even more money for him to give her. According to the examiner, This was too much. It appeared to him, he declared, that the medium wished to get all his property from him and turn him out in the cold, and though this would likely facilitate his entrance into the same world as his beloved Sarah, he was not in favor of it. And if you were a penniless old man in 1927 without the kind of social security nets we have in place now, it could hasten your death. You might starve to death due to lack of food, freeze to death for lack of shelter, or die from being unable to have medical conditions treated. And John wasn't quite that anxious to join his beloved Sarah in the afterlife, at least not just yet. So it caused him to question Mrs. Moore's motives. It opened his eyes, Sabold said. I told her she was a fake. I broke away. I took the will made out in her favor and marked it null and void. 
John also thought back about his prior experiences at Mrs. Moore's seances. He then related how the medium had cautioned him not to touch anything in the darkened room. To touch a spirit meant death. He was to do nothing until advice had been passed on to him by the managing guides. Pondering over the commands, his eyes continued to open. He came to believe that the spirits were no more than Mrs. Moore, who dressed in a spirit cabinet in flowing robes touched with phosphorescent material that made them glow with a weird and unearthly light. So maybe it wouldn't mean instant death if he had touched a spirit. Maybe that instruction was just meant to keep him from finding out that he was being tricked with techniques borrowed from stage magic. And maybe Mrs. Moore had been impersonating Sarah every time she had appeared to John. It was a horrifying thought. And, in fact, John thought that he had evidence that that was what had happened. According to the Wichita Eagle, He said he first became suspicious when the apparition of Sarah, his so-called soulmate of the spirit land, came into his room one morning at two o'clock. The trouble was, Sabold saw a bare arm that looked rather substantial and human, he declared, and Sarah did not simply vanish or recede as he supposed ethereal beings were accustomed to do. She departed in an entirely different manner. She backed out and turned the corner of the door. It was then, Sabold says, he first began to suspect that Mrs. Moore was not the true medium that he had believed in strongly enough to invest money in a co-effort to promote spiritualism. So, as horrifying as the thought was, he'd seen evidence that Mrs. Moore might be hoaxing him. Besides canceling their arrangement and marking the will null and void, did John do anything else? He did. Uh, first, he took back the two deeds on his farm so Mrs. Moore wouldn't get those. And he did some calculating and realized that adding up all the things he'd bought and all the money he'd given her, Mrs. Moore owed him at least $7,500, which would be worth $120,000 today. He was mad and he wanted it back. So he went to a couple of attorneys Harry Castor and Petey Gardner, and decided to sue her in court. His attorneys thus dutifully filed a complaint, and preparations for the trial began. Was John's faith in spiritualism shaken by this experience? Actually, no. He now thought that Mrs. Moore was a fraud, but that didn't mean that spiritualism was false. According to the examiner, Belief of the aged man in spiritualism, which he had studied 30 years, is not shaken by the loss of his money, he says. Only his faith in Mrs. Moore of Wichita is shaken. In the meantime, he apparently believes his marriage to the mystic Sarah holds until the courts act on his civil suit for his money and property. Just how a judge can divorce the ghost is not stated by Mr. Sabold. Apparently, however, he believes favorable action on his suit will be vindication of his renunciation of the marriage. I have studied it 30 years, he said recently. I now believe that Mrs. Moore did not have the real power to communicate with spirits. I hope the suit will settle that to my satisfaction and will reveal whether I am still married to Sarah. So he was still a believer in spiritualism, and he was even open to the idea that he really was married to Sarah if it turned out that his doubts were wrong and Mrs. Moore really did have the ability to contact the spirits. But he was disappointed and complained about the fact that Sarah didn't show up for the wedding in material form, at least not in the full-bodied way he expected. And what about Mrs. Moore? What did she have to say after John filed suit? According to the examiner, Mrs. Moore has refused to make any public statements about the merits or demerits of the suit. My side of the matter will be told in time, she said to a newspaper reporter. Until then, my attorneys do not want me to talk. And that's actually really good legal advice. Uh, clients often harm their cases, either by speaking to the police or to the press. In fact, we've previously linked a really awesome video by Regent Law Professor James Duane explaining why you should not talk to the police, especially without your lawyer. And we'll have another link to it in today's further resources so you can watch it and find out why. It's really eye-opening and covers all 
all kinds of things you wouldn't have imagined. So Mrs. Moore's attorneys actually gave her really good advice about letting her side of the story get told at the trial. You can just imagine how she could hurt her case by making ill-advised statements to the press that John's lawyers could then make use of against her in court. When did the trial take place? Originally, it was thought that it would take place in the summer, but as so often happens with court cases, there were delays. The case was filed in the first week of March 1927, and Moore's attorneys had 30 days to file a reply. The reply was due on Friday, April 1st, so April Fool's Day, but they needed more time, so according to the April 1st edition of the Wichita Eagle, Attorney P.D. Gardner of the law firm of Gardner & Helsel will file a motion sometime Friday asking for additional time. Our answer in the case, Mr. Gardner said Thursday evening, has not yet been drawn up. The 30 days from the date of filing the suit will be up Friday. We cannot have the answer drawn before the end of the court day, so we will just have to file the usual pleadings and request more time. Eventually, the trial got underway on Thursday, November 3rd, and people were very interested in it. In fact, there was a murder trial going on across the hallway, but some of the people from the murder trial came over to watch the ghost trial instead, as you do. Two of the witnesses that gave testimony were a pair of young men from Scotland. Their names were Paul McLaren and B.C. McCartney, and they had been to Mrs. Moore at one of her seances. According to the Wichita Eagle, McLaren, a tall, dark-haired young man with a serious expression in his eyes, was the first up. He says he attended a seance at 624 South Main Street sometime before Mrs. Moore moved out on Green Avenue and then later to 710 North Lawrence Avenue. Did you see any spirits there or talk to any? McLaren was asked. I don't much think I did, he scoffed. I saw some mechanical devices. McLaren then went on to tell how Mrs. Moore entered upon a seance and then he asked her for a communication with one Mike Lorber. Mike's shade was immediately forthcoming, McLaren said, and Mike proceeded to tell how happy he was and how nice everything was in the world to which he had grown accustomed since his death. There was just one problem. Mike Lorber was still alive. This seemed strange to the inquisitive young fellows, for when they'd last seen Mike that afternoon, he seemed perfectly capable of doing a full day's work, and if he had died in the meantime, he wouldn't have had time to get accustomed to his new surroundings. In fact, Mike did come back to work next day, one of the boys testified, but at the time they contented themselves, McLaren said, in exposing for their own satisfaction the tricks of the trade. They told Mrs. Moore, McLaren said, that this was a joke, explaining the hoax to her, and then asked to see her equipment. They said, according to McLaren, that they were going doing work of the same kind and were after pointers. Then, McLaren said, Mrs. Moore showed them the trumpet through which the spirit messages came. To the small end of this trumpet was attached a rubber hose, which was concealed by a dark cloth, he said. And when the newspaper refers to a trumpet, don't think the musical instrument with all its curves and valves. Think low-tech megaphone like you'd use to project your voice. So that was how John had heard Sarah's pleasant voice in the darkened seance room. Spirit trumpets were not uncommon in seances like this. Uh, They weren't even hidden. In fact, spiritual mediums often used them to help amplify the weak, ethereal spirit voices. And sometimes they even made the trumpets float about the room during the seance. But they weren't supposed to be connected to the medium's mouth by a hose. Mrs. Moore also allegedly showed the two young men several additional tricks she used in seances, thinking that they were aspiring mediums themselves. That kind of testimony would make her look really bad. Was she ashamed to show her face after that? To some degree, apparently so. She had been reticent about having her picture taken for a long time, and for a long time, there was only one picture that was known of her. When the trial began, the Wichita Eagle asked her to pose for a picture, but she refused to do so, and all they got was a picture of her turned back. 
However, uh, back in the day when newspapers were a thing and every city had more than one of them, there was competition between them. So the rival paper, the Wichita Beacon, was very proud of it when they managed to scoop the eagle by getting an actual picture of Mrs. Moore at the trial. As they explained, at the courthouse, their ace photographer, Scotty, crawled under a table, focused his camera, and shot the photo with his foot. They then proceeded to print it in the beacon next to an inset photo of John Sebald. They also had other members of Mrs. Moore's circle of uh, followers testify. It turned out that the spiritualist classes she held in her home typically had from 7 to 15 people present and sometimes as many as 25. So if she was charging $2 per seance and there were usually 7 to 15 people there, that would mean that she was pulling in an average of $22 or about $350 today per seance. And it turns out that Mrs. Moore had been a successful matchmaker for others as well. One of the ghost paramours was named Aletha Narcissus, and the gentleman she was interested in even got a picture of her. According to the Eagle, Clarence George, who attended Mrs. Moore's seances, and who said he too had been initiated into the joys of knowing there was a soulmate waiting for a reunion in the hereafter, said the picture, the picture of Aletha Narcissus came from the spirit cabinet during one of the meetings. Other members of the class got spirit pictures, he explained. All of them, he was asked? Just some of them, was his answer. Over the objections of the defendant, Aletha's picture was admitted to the records of the court. Mr. George, a young man, said he too had had private seances in which only he and Mrs. Moore were present in material form. During some of these seances, he communed with his soulmate. The witness said he had attended Mrs. Moore's meetings from December 10, 1925, until the time of the split between Mrs. Moore and Sabold. He said that his interest in such things had waned somewhat since. The Eagle also described the spirit picture of Aletha Narcissus that Clarence George received. It is just a bit vague, like the copies transferred from one piece of paper to another by the use of a bit of soap and a little rubbing. But nevertheless, it showed her features clearly, including the peaches and cream complexion of her cheeks, the rosiness of her very kissable lips, which seemed a bit too provocative for the equipment of an ethereal spirit, and the beginnings of what must have been a very modish hat, direct from some Paris of the misty half-world. So the late Miss Aletha Narcissus was apparently quite the fashionable looker. After John's lawyers had called various witnesses to build their case that Mrs. Moore had committed fraud, what did her defense lawyers do? They immediately put Mrs. Moore herself on the stand so that she could tell her side of the story, just like she said she would. She acknowledged that John Sebold had come to live in her home and that he was paying $40 a month for room and board. According to the Wichita Eagle, He was ill, she said, and she attended to his special diet, going into details about her preparations of a concoction of milk and lemon juice, of which he was to eat the whey. The place was crowded, what with the children and all, and Mrs. Moore said they were, went looking for better quarters at Sabold's suggestion, finally taking the house at 710 North Lawrence Avenue. He wanted to promote spiritualism, she said, and leave something good behind him to perpetuate his memory. The arrangement they had, she said, was that he was to furnish the money because he knew she had none, and she was to furnish the spiritualistic work. I've lived poorly all my life, Sabold is alleged to have told her, and now I want some comfort a comfortable home, and someone to take care of it. So, according to Mrs. Moore, the move to the larger house was John's idea, not hers. And he wanted to live in a more comfortable place in his remaining years with someone to take care of the place for him. And he wanted to leave behind a memorial to preserve his memory by promoting spiritualism. The Eagle continued, Mrs. Moore's defense is hinged on assertions that all their dealings were of a business nature. She went over all bills with him, she said, gave him notes for what she owed, and chattel mortgages for what was purchased by her with money or checks he gave her. And these notes and mortgages had been made out with her lawyers present, so they were legally on the up and up. The diamond ring, Sabold says he bought from her for Sarah, Mrs. Moore says, she sold him outright at a fair value because she needed money to keep up individual expenses. She says everything was settled for, excepting about $700, or $11,000 today, 
of the money he gave her for the education of her children. Mrs. Moore said she had a perfectly good automobile, but Sabold wanted them to have a better one, so he prevailed on her to trade for a new car. He took up the mortgage on the old one. About the land he deeded to her, she says she didn't know anything about them until he gave them to her. So her story was that these things were actually John's idea, not things that she or the spirits had told him to do, at least as far as she knew, because she said on cross-examination that she didn't remember anything from when she was in a trance during the seances. So she didn't know for sure what the spirits may have told him. Personally, I'm skeptical of that. I'm disinclined to believe it when people report that they don't remember anything about what happened when they were in a trance, whether it's a hypnotic trance or any other kind. But other people don't agree with me and think that uh, total amnesia during a trance is quite possible. Mrs. Moore also said that she did not introduce Sarah to John. Instead, she said John already knew Sarah, and John told her about Sarah being in or perhaps from Dayton, Ohio. Mrs. Moore says she doesn't even know of Sabold's marriage to Sarah, at which function she is said by him to have officiated. She also said she remembered no conversations or expositions with McLaren and McCartney. She positively denied she had any trumpets with hoses attached to them. And it's possible that Mrs. Moore could have had no knowledge of the marriage to Sarah, even though other people attended it, if it were true that she didn't remember what happened in her trances, and if she was in a trance the whole time of the wedding, and if she was also in a trance for some reason when all the wedding preparations were being made. Mrs. Moore also offered an alternative account of the reason the two of them split up and dissolved their arrangement. According to the Eagle, Mrs. Moore's answer to the allegations made against her in this case is that Sabold wanted to establish a spiritualistic classroom with her, but that he began to make claims of healing powers through his own mediumship, and she broke with him. And she could point to John's nickname, Doctor in support of the healing powers claim, as well as the testimony of one follower that John had helped him get rid of a headache and that he had been trying to develop as a spiritualist to the point that he could summon spirits like Sarah himself. She also could point to the fact that John often helped out with her organizing her seances, perhaps indicating a partnership that could have gone bad. Some of the witnesses indicated John would do things like receive attendees at the door, tell them where to put their hats because hats were a thing then, uh, show them where to sit, receive their money, and so forth. Did any of the witnesses indicate that John had known Sarah before he met Mrs. Moore? Yes, at least two of them did. One of them even said that John had known her as a schoolgirl and that they had gone to the same school together. How was this case being decided? Was there a jury hearing all this testimony? No, this was a civil case rather than a criminal one, and the attorneys for both John and Mrs. Moore agreed that the judge could decide it. It would be way quicker, easier, and cheaper that way. So the person hearing the evidence was Judge J.E. Alexander, and he would be deciding who won. How did the case turn out? Did the judge decide whether Mrs. Moore really had mediumistic abilities and thus whether John was married to Sarah like he wanted the judge to figure out? No, the U.S. Constitution has an important provision in the First Amendment to the Constitution, it provides for freedom of religion. And the way that the First Amendment has been interpreted and applied, it makes it really hard for courts to decide questions of a religious nature. I mean, we don't want the courts deciding which doctrines are true and which aren't. That's inconsistent with religious liberty. And since spiritualism is a religion, that would make it hard for the judge to rule on the question of whether Mrs. Moore could genuinely contact spirits. If at all possible, the judge would be inclined to set that question aside and try to decide the case on other grounds. Then, apart from the issue of contacting spirits, was the judge able to decide whether Mrs. Moore had com committed some form of fraud? He might have been able to do that, except he also didn't have to go to that question because the defense lawyers presented a different basis on which he could make a ruling. They focused their arguments on what John Sabald knew 
and when he knew it, and then what he did with that knowledge. You see, John had already come to suspect that Mrs. Moore was a fraud when she gave him the deeds to his land in exchange for the chattel mortgages and the promissory notes that he held on her car and furnishings. By his own testimony, he came to suspect her after he saw that too solid looking arm pretending to be Sarah's come into his bedroom at two in the morning. So when Mrs. Moore said, I'll give you the deeds to your farms back if you give me back the chattel mortgages and promissory notes, he already suspected she was hoaxing him. And he should not have accepted the deeds in exchange for the mortgages and notes. By doing so, her lawyers argued, John was knowingly making a compromise settlement. He knew that she had the deeds to his farms and that she was a fraud, and he wanted the deeds to his farms back, so he gave her the documents she wanted back as a compromise. That way, he voluntarily cut his losses by making the compromise. And what should he have done instead? Go to court and have the deeds to the farms set aside on the grounds they were obtained by fraud. As the Wichita Eagle explains, In that case, his suit would have rested squarely on the issue of fraud. But after he became convinced of the actions he later charged as fraudulent, he was the victim of no illusions when he made the final deal. But he didn't do that. Instead, he gave her back the mortgages and the promissory notes in exchange for the deed. And her attorneys argued that that was a voluntary compromise settlement. What did the judge end up ruling? According to the November 17th edition of the Iola Daily Register of Iola, Kansas, John Sabold of Liberal, Kansas, farmer, has lost his battle with the Spooks and his $7,500 district court damage suit against Mrs. Nellie Moore, spirit medium, through a decision of district court judge J.E. Alexander. The plaintiff, the judge wrote, is precluded by the compromise and settlement entered into with the defendant from maintaining this action. Close quote. All of Sabold's business transactions were down in black and white. When he loaned money to Mrs. Moore, he took a note for it. When he purchased a new article of furniture for her home, he took a chattel mortgage, the court pointed out. Sabold, during the trial, contended that he went so far in following the advice given by the spirits through Mrs. Moore that he deeded her some farmland. This she returned to him, he alleged during the trial, in return for the release of her mortgages and notes. And it was this agreement which Sabold's attorneys contended was illegal, but which Judge Alexander upheld regarding it as a compromise settlement. In the letter today, the court does not attempt to rule on the nature of the mysterious Sarah, soulmate and spirit bride to whom Sabold contended he was married by Mrs. Moore in a ghostly ceremony. Neither has the court anything to say about the legal advice given by the ghost of a former noted Kansas attorney and politician. The decision is based entirely on a point of law. Even presuming that the results were accomplished by fraud, Sabold, says Judge Alexander's decision, has no case because of his own admission of making an airtight settlement and compromise after his suspicions were aroused and before bringing his troubles into court. So the judge didn't have to rule either on the issue of contacting spirits or whether John was married to Sarah or whether Mrs. Moore had committed to fraud, because whether or not she had, John believed she had committed fraud and he gave her back the documents she wanted in exchange for the documents he wanted, making that a voluntary compromise settlement, according to the judge which serves as a good illustration of why you should get competent legal advice before you make transactions like this. If John had spoken to his own own lawyers first, he might have been able to get the deed set aside on the grounds of fraud, and then John could have gotten back everything, potentially, including payment for the $7,500 or $120,000 today that he had spent on Mrs. Moore and her children. I guess it was a good thing that Mrs. Moore's attorneys asked for extra time on Friday, April 1st, so they could prepare their case, which was ultimately successful. Indeed, uh, they ended up prevailing. They were no April Fool's. And by a strange coincidence, 
Friday, April 1st is today, too. So today's April Fool's Day. So this is an April Fool's episode. Yes, it is. We've done April Fool's episodes every year here on Mysterious World. And so far, I've made sure that everything I say in an April Fool's episode is technically true, even though it's highly misleading. That makes the April Fool's episodes object lessons where you can use critical thinking to see how even true statements can be misleading. But after several years of doing such April Fool's episodes, many listeners are expecting me to be both truthful and highly misleading. But I wanted to keep them on their toes and using their critical thinking skills. I I don't want them to be able to assume that what I'm saying is misleading just because it's April 1st and that whatever wild story we're telling on that day isn't true. So what did you decide to do this year? To tell a wild story that is absolutely true and not misleading at all. The April Fool's joke this year is that the entire story of the Ghost Bride, as we've told it, happened in just the way we've said, at least according to the evidence I have. I mean, that evidence is taken from newspapers, but these are serious newspapers. And while they may contain minor inaccuracies like any newspaper story, they should get the fundamental facts of the case right. So the April Fool's joke this year is that there isn't an April Fool's joke. The story of John Sebald and his ghost bride, Sarah, is what it appears to be. And the listeners who knew about our April Fool's tradition and those who didn't are on an equal footing for once. So I invite listeners to remember that in the future April Fool's episodes we do to stay on their toes and keep using their critical thinking skills throughout the episode Maybe we're telling a wild story and being misleading about it, but maybe we're telling a wild story and not being misleading at all. So have fun in future April Fool's episodes trying to figure out which is the case before we do the reveal. And there will always be a reveal at some point, even if it isn't clear or immediate, because we won't leave you hanging. So since this was a real mystery, what is your bottom line on John Sabold and Sarah? Sarah may or may not have been a girl that John had known at school, but we have no evidence that her ghost was appearing to John. Mrs. Moore was simply a fraud, and John was foolish to spend money on her in the way that he did. Unfortunately, this is not a lone case. While there are many mediums who sincerely believe that they're in contact with spirits, many also have been frauds, and there are many stories of psychics and mediums bilking gullible clients like John out of very large sums of money. John should have taken a more skeptical approach to this than he did. He should have examined Mrs. Moore's claims and activities using critical thinking early on, not belatedly the way he did. He should have consulted with lawyers before giving her back the documents requiring her to pay back all the money, and he should have heeded the biblical warning against consulting mediums. And he especially should have heeded Jesus Frank's statement that in the next life, human beings will be like the angels of heaven, neither marrying nor giving in marriage. So, sorry, but you can't marry a ghost. So, Jimmy, what further resources can we offer on this topic? We'll have a link to a book by Mark Hartzman called Chasing Ghosts, and it's a really fascinating history of ghostly phenomena, including in recent times. He interviews a bunch of prominent people, including some that I know. Uh, and it was in this book that I first found the um, the account or an account of the story we told today. Uh, Mark Hartsman has a little summary of this case, but only a little summary. And I did a bunch of searching with other books and and on the internet and Nobody else has been on this case. Mark Hartsman is the one. I mean, he's got like a the same basic little summary on a on a web page he runs, but it's tiny and it doesn't go into all the details. So at first I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to get enough detail to do this episode, but I did. I uh, I went on newspapers.com and they have a treasure trove of old newspapers that you can use to find out about things like this. So we'll have links to the San Francisco Examiner, the Wichita Eagle, the Iola Daily Register, um, which are three of the newspapers that um, that 
uh, the, today's story was taken from. And if you have a newspapers.com subscription, you can read the original stories for yourself. We'll also have a link to James Dwayne's video, Don't Talk to the Police. And we'll also have a link to a really disturbing video that you can watch at your own hazard. Okay. So, Jimmy, what do we have for mysterious headlines this week? Well, since we covered an unusual marriage in our episode today, we have an unusual marriage theme. And it turns out John is not the only person to ever want to marry a ghost. In fact, right now, there is a British singer named Brocard, uh, and she wants to marry and plans to marry the ghost of a Victorian era soldier. Uh, she also will be inviting celebrity ghosts to attend the wedding as guests. So you can read about her story and her plans to marry a ghost. Some people are even more ambitious than marrying ghosts. And we'll have a story about a California woman who married the color pink. So um, you can read all about her plans and then how the wedding actually came off, the historic ceremony where a human married a color. Um, and needless to say, the color was rather prominent in the uh, in the wedding decorations. Of course. Well, I mean, you've got to, the, the groom has to be present, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, these aren't April Fool's jokes. These, these are not April Fool's <laughs> jokes. These are real newspaper stories. <laughs> OK. All right. So that's it from us this time. We would love to hear your theories about John Sabold and his ghost bride, Sarah. You can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akins Mysterious World Facebook page or sending an email to mysterious at sqpn.com. You can send a tweet to at MYS underscore world or call our mysterious feedback line at 619-738-4515. That's 619-738-4515. And I want to say a special thanks to Oasis Studio 7 for the video work and animation that they do on this episode. Uh, it adds a lot of value to the episode. If you are currently listening on a podcast player and just hearing the audio, you can see all the great work that they do to enhance these episodes by going to my YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken, J-I-M-M-Y-A-K-I-N. Just go to youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken, and you can watch the video versions of the podcast there. And also while you're there, I'm trying to grow my channel, so I'd really appreciate it if you would subscribe and hit the bell notification so that you get an alert every time we have a new video. And thank you very much. And thank you to John and Jessica of Oasis Studio 7 for all the work that they do. Excellent. So, Jimmy, what's the next episode going to be about? Next week, we are we had a woman who married the color pink in today's headline. So mm -hmm. you might wonder what would be reproductive consequences of that. And next week, we're going to be having a story about green children, namely the green children of Woolpit. So we're going to be going back to medieval England. And there's actually... Uh, better data than you might think about the green children of Woolpit. And we're going to look into the mystery and what would have caused these green children to appear. Interesting. Folks, uh, follow Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, your favorite podcast app, or at that YouTube channel where, again, you should make sure you sh to subscribe and hit the bell to get notifications. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion and links to the mysterious headlines on our show notes at sqpn.com slash mysterious. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by Fear Vento Law, PLLC, specializing in adult guardianships and conservatorships, probate and estate planning matters, accepting clients throughout Michigan, taking into account your individual health care, financial and religious needs. Visit fearventolaw.com, F-I-O-R-V-E-N-T-O law.com. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. Thank you.